Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, which is organizing the framework of the European Sustainable Energy Week, which this year is a very unusual one, but also very productive and uh, uh, important. Uh, our webinar title is uh, Decarbonizing Industry and the ICT Sector, Energy and CO2 Saving Potentials in the Short and in the Longer Term. And it's an event which is co-hosted by the European Industrial Insulation Foundation, the European Alliance to Save Energy, the German Environmental um, Agency, and the Fraunhofer Institute for System and Innovation Research. My name is Monica Frassoni, and I am the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Um, and I would like now to uh, give the floor for uh, welcoming this uh, and introducing this, uh, this webinar to Peter Hoodmaker, who is the president of the European Industrial Insulation Foundation. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Monica. Dear distinguished guests, collaborating partners, and um, ladies and gentlemen, it's also my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, which is a part of the EU Sustainability Sustainable Energy Week 2020 Extended Program. Monica already explained that it was co-hosted by a number of organizations, so I will not repeat that. And in the, nine, in the next about 90 minutes, we will have the opportunity to discuss with a cross-sectoral group of business representatives about, number one, technologies and approaches to save energy and reduce emissions in industry, especially in the short term, and needed policy guardrails for greenhouse neutral, greenhouse gas neutral EU industry in the longer term. So what can we expect from this webinar? After three impulse presentations, we will have a panel discussion followed by a question and answer session. And the webinar ends with a short conclusion from my side. So I think we should not uh, waste a lot of time of having nice words to each other and get <laughs> into the matter. And um, I think, uh, Monica, I give it back to you. Thank you very much, Peter. So let's uh, start. And um, the first uh, question that our speakers, our panelists will have to answer in their three uh, present, early present, first presentation is what it takes to tap the energy and CO2 saving potential in industry and the ICT sector, because indeed we see also in the political discussion that this is probably an under-evaluated point um, and that should not be uh, underestimated because its impact is quite important. And I would like first to give the floor to Andreas uh, Gürtler, who is the director of the European Industrial Insulation Foundation, and he will talk about saving 6% of industrial CO2 emission in Europe through industrial insulation. Please, Andreas, you have the floor for, for about less than 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. So um, as soon as I have the control, I can start the presentation. A warm welcome to everybody um, joining this webinar. And um, yeah, let's jump directly into Medias Res. I don't tell a lot about EIIF. You find all information online, just as much as our job is to initiate projects to create energy efficiency in industry, support industry, uh, helping them to save energy, reduce CO2 emission, and uh, yeah, getting more sustainable. Um, what we can see here is the EIIF's Green Deal goals, uh, which are very much linked to uh, what had been discussed at the fifth global in, um, international energy agency conference, where we said that um, there is, I don't know who's ticking now the slides, uh, maybe this is uh, Matteo. Uh, anyhow, um, going back to it, sorry for that. Now it jumps out again. That is the Zoom. Okay, let me just try if that works. Okay, in the testing it went all fine. Okay, um, so what, what we do see is that energy efficiency um, in the building sector when it comes to insulation is very well known and very much applied. But if we compare this with the industrial world, 
we can compare, for example, heat loss rates, and we can see that at a significant higher temperature, we find, for example, in a power plant, we have a heat loss rate of 150 watts per square meter, <clears throat> leading to an insulation system of 100 millimeters. If we see the development in the building codes, and we made a study ourselves on the average heat loss, which is accepted, uh, we can see that uh, from 2010 to 2016, it has been reduced by more than 50%, leading to insulation thicknesses uh, four to five times more than what was applied before. And we all know that uh, nobody is going to build a house today without insulating the roof. But this is not at all the case in industry. And I will give you some examples for this. Our second task um, is that we want to promote insulation inspections. We are running the tip check program, technical insulation performance check, which is very much linked to the article eight of the energy efficiency directive. And we are providing with the TBI app, a free tool, uh, which you can download to a mobile device like your mobile phone to quickly inspect if a system has potential to save and reduce CO2 emissions. Okay, jumping from here and looking at this big difference between the building sector requirements and the lack of any mandatory requirements for insulation. So it's up to the industrial asset owner how and how energy efficient he wants to insulate his plant. Um, we can see that there is a very big difference. A German group of engineers organized in the German Association of, um, of Engineers uh, Matteo, this is not working today. I don't know why. Um, if I click on the next slide, okay, now it seems to do. If not, I would just ask you then um, to further continue with the slides. So the German uh, Association for Energy, VDI, has developed an energy class for insulation systems in industry. And the way they did it was they were checking. Uh, if you use insulation, you can see, of course, in the manufacturing process of the insulation material, you will emit some CO2. And of course, the more insulation you put, the less energy you need, and therefore you reduce the CO2 emission. And there is something like the ecological optimum, where the life cycle assessment curve has the lowest point, and the energy classes are defined as such that we say from the ecological optimum plus 20% of emissions, we still call it energy class A from 20 to 35B, and so on and forth. I think this is pretty clear. So if we look at today's quality of insulation applied in the industry, we can see that uh, this quality level is pretty poor. So if you look at the energy class for wall at 200 degrees, according to the standard, we can see that most systems in Europe, if they are insulated, are insulated with an energy class G, mainly trying to keep the surface temperature below 55 degrees Celsius, the idea of energy efficiency is not there. If we then compare the different markets in uh, Europe with uh, the biggest industrial player, Germany, we can see that if best practice is applied in Germany, they get to class E, but this is only for best practice and this is pretty far away from an energy efficient system. In France and the Netherlands, we initiated subsidy programs for insulation, but they don't go further than the energy class F. And for example, in Spain, the best practice is still in the G level. The best in class, however, in Europe is Sweden. And if their best practice is applied, they go up to D. So we see there's quite huge potential to improve and to be more energy efficient if we just look at this short-term technology. So what is also very, very important is that at low temperature, middle temperature and high temperature ranges from 100 to 100 to 300 and 300 degrees, we see that systems are very often completely uninsulated. So for example, in the low temperature uh, range, we see 10% of equipment not covered with insulation, 6% in the middle and two in the high temperature area. And consequently insulating this uh, is leading to the 6% reduction potential in industry, adding to the energy class uh, uh, I will talk about. So let me give you a practical example from industry. Uh, very often in our uh, inspections, we find valves, flanges, and this kind of single equipment not insulated at all. This is from a real tip check, and it was a DN150 uh, valve, industrial valve, not insulated. 
the medium liquid inside the temperature had 150 degrees. And to keep it at 150 degrees, you need the thermal energy input. As this was not insulated at all, you can see the heat flying away, leading to an energy loss per year of 10,600 kilowatt hours. One of our tip check engineers, Patrick Dallens, who did this job, then said, okay, if we put a box around it, we can reduce the energy loss from 10,600 down to 600, which means we can reduce the thermal energy input into the system. So we save about 10,000 kilowatt hours. And then he asked himself, okay, if I take these 10,000 kilowatt hours, what can I do with it? For example, I can charge the battery of an electric car. First, I have to transfer these 10,000 kilowatt hours thermal energy into electric energy. And we do this with a very conservative rate of 40% uh, thermal efficiency. Um, I don't know why it doesn't go further. Okay. And we would like to start a poll and ask all the audience now to guess with these 10,000 kilometers. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> there was the answer already. So maybe we skip the poll. Um, I don't know why we have these technical problems today, but uh, let's live with it. So it is 20,000 kilometers. Um, and uh, with these 20,000 kilometers, we touch upon almost the entire annual mileage, what normal people would drive. And this is just by insulating one industrial valve with a very standardized insulation box and taking these savings to charge the battery. Okay. Okay. Matteo, can we try that I just tell you to click? Uh, as, as this is not working uh, for whatever reason today. So please, the next slide. Yeah, thanks. This is the calculation. Let's jump to the next one. Okay, we see the uh, very surprising poll results, 95% uh, percent after seeing the answer already. Of course, we're going for it. I think it's better to save some time here. And uh, please don't for uh, forget to click off the, the, the poll window. Yeah, let's go uh, again to the next slide. So these kind of equipment, um, Matteo, if you click once more, please, um, you can see this is what we find in our inspections in every plant, everywhere. There's a lot of single equipment which is not insulated. And uh, if we look at, next slide please, uh, American refinery, for example, we can find 28,000 valves and we can be sure that most of them are not insulated. If it's a smaller refinery, we talk about 5,000. Um, so you can estimate or you, you, you get a picture of what potential is, is lying in industry by just using a best available technology more consequently than before. Next slide, please. Okay, what we do now here is again a tip check example comparing what we ask buildings and what we don't ask in industry. So here, if you click you see that we have 60 degrees Celsius in a hot water storage tank, which is this one. And next to this refinery office building, we see an oil storage tank. In this oil storage tank, uh, there is some liquid stored. Matteo, if you could just simply click, um, uh, uh, yeah, let's say three times. Okay, so we can see here that the hot water storage tank and this is symbolic. Now we developed this with EIIF in principle to, to make it easier to, to compare. We know that the building appliances, um, due to the eco labeling, which is quite successful, you won't find anyone which is less energy efficient than the energy class A. In industry, there's nothing like this. So the asset owner having a lot of corrosion problems on the roof of his oil storage tank, um, decided that he doesn't want to insulate the rooftop again. If you click once more, please. And this would have led to 1,900 tons of CO2 per year, because this is a huge surface, the surface of a, of a soccer field, emitting 60 degrees Celsius, uh, 365 days per year. So nobody in the world would ever have the idea to heat up a football field every day in the year to 60 degrees Celsius. 
But this is real life happening in industry because they are very afraid of corrosion. If we go to the next slide, please, we see that the tip check engineer finally convinced his client that he should use an insulation system. And the client agreed to use a very standard basic one with 30 millimeters insulation, at least reducing the 1,900 tons of CO2 down to 440. Technically, it would be feasible to use 200 millimeter on this roof. And with this, if you click to the next slide, we would achieve exactly the same energy efficiency performance than we have in the hot water storage tank inside the office building. So the technology is there, the solution is there. It's just a completely different way how industry looks at the best available technique insulation. And we see the big difference, the lack of regulation in industry, which we find in the building sector leading to much more energy efficient systems. And now compare the CO2. If you look at the CO2 figure, you see that it's 75 tons instead of 1,900 tons. Also, this is a real example. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. You see the old roof, you see the corrosion, and you can see the people standing here, the workers. And you see the massive surface, as I said, equivalent to a football field. So the solution in the end was only energy class G. But if you click more, uh, you can see with an investment of 400,000 euro, roughly, the money saved per year is 230,000 euros. So everybody can calculate a payback of less than two years. Energy, we save 7,600. And in CO2, roughly 2,000 tons. So it makes absolutely sense for industry to do that. And uh, actually, it makes industry more competitive because they reduce production costs. But the awareness and the understanding of insulation in industry is completely different. And we won't get there if there is no regulation which just picks it up and accelerates the whole process. If you can go to the next slide, please. So if, for example, a regulation would ask for an energy class C as the minimum requirement for any industrial equipment that can be insulated, if you click once more, we can save about 45 megatons of CO2 in Europe. If we click on the next uh, slide, equivalent, if we just take the process industry, so without power generation, we talk about 36, if you click, 36.4 megatons, and this sums up to the 6% reduction potential in EU industry, if we would just make mandatory to insulate with the energy class C. If we take everything, transportation, aviation, power generation, and all we have in the EU, what causes emission, we can save the 45 megatons, again, with an energy class C requirement, and we would reduce immediately about 1% of the EU emissions. And we would do that cost efficient and, and uh, with all advantages, which I want to show you on the next slide. So for the global climate, we would just have 45 megatons less of CO2 emissions every year. For the European Union, it's a great contribution to the Green Deal and getting to net zero in 2050. For green recovery, it saves jobs in Europe. Just to let you know, in our industrial insulation sector, there are companies who are reducing the workforce due to the COVID crisis by one third. So this is really significant. And of course, a mandatory requirement would save jobs and maybe even create some jobs here and there. The manufacturing of insulation, the installation of insulation, all happens here in Europe. For industry, it's a smart investment. The short payback times, we did more than 500 tip check energy audits. The average payback time is two years. The reduced production cost, so after two years, um, industry benefits from a reduced production cost. They will have lower CO2 certificate cost, lower energy bill, and of course that pays off. And we talk about safer and better working conditions. So there is no one to lose. A regulation in place would accelerate, and this is what we call a short-term goal or a short-term technology to decarbonize industry. Of course, it's one little step, but we are very sure there are more overlooked best available technologies like industrial insulation. And we come to the last slide. Okay. And we just ask, um, why do we hesitate to put uh, a regulation in place for energy efficient equipment uh, to tap immediately 
and uh, sooner the better these potentials to do a first step in the right direction. So thank you for your uh, attention and I'm sorry for the technical problems, but I hope we managed to get over it. And I give back to Monica. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to remind, thank you very much, Andreas. It was extremely clear and very, uh, and very visual. So I think that uh, there is no way to miss the message. Uh, in any case, I just wanted to remind everyone assisting that uh, the question and answers are open. So you can write them and type them in the, uh, in the appropriate uh, uh, place. Uh, and, uh, and this would be very helpful also for the further debate that we have in front of us. I would like now uh, to give the floor to uh, Gael Suchet, who is the Senior Product Manager, New Energy Storage from Schneider Electric, who is a member of the a founding member of the European Alliance to Save Energy, and I really thank him to be here. And he will talk about the growing demand of data center, the challenge of reducing the energy use of the world's fastest growing industry. Monsieur thank Suchet. You. Merci. Thank you, Monica. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to, to to welcome me in this uh, in this meeting. So I, I will share with you some slides uh, discussing about this uh, this is quite strange animal that we call data center, uh, which is which is between between the the industry and the building there's always a lot of discussions uh, around this today uh, we, we've been discovering all uh, uh, because of the crisis we went through that data centers are, are key uh, for for our uh, for our uh, i would say uh, lives today uh, for example uh, getting through some uh, school uh, Visio meetings or whatever uh, during this crisis, uh, a lot of things uh, went through these uh, these data centers today. Uh, is something that is maybe not uh, really known by everybody. Uh, sometimes it's pointed out because of these uh, big energy consumptions for sure. Uh, and if we if we go to the next slide, just some some words about uh, Schneider Electric. Uh, we, uh, as Schneider Electric, we provide energy and automation uh, digital solutions for uh, the efficiency and sustainability. Uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, we did a very strong transformations within Schneider Electric to, to promote and to provide uh, solutions to our uh, customers. We, we, we started with, um, with you know, selling uh, products and then we've been now selling solutions and our key message is really saving uh, saving energy uh, proposing solutions uh, through also the digitization sorry of all our systems uh, to connect our products uh, and to be able to monitor all of our products to propose uh, solutions to our customers that will really help to drive this uh, efficiency uh, and sustainability of the the, the solutions we sell and if we focus on the data centers itself uh, and if we go to the next slide please so we we, we now have some uh, specific suites uh, that we call eco structure that are of course applicable for for many different types of applications from building to infrastructure and if we focus on data center uh, we connect our products uh, through some uh, edge controls uh, and thanks to a lot of different applications we have we are able to provide uh, solutions to our customers to really reduce and control uh, their energy consumptions and as a consequence uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, we, we, we know also that 24% of this efficiency uh, can be uh, driven by these uh, controls and solutions on top of many other ones uh, like like it's been said before insulation uh, of the buildings uh, can be part of it for sure but we also know that the control and the digital control of the systems of the products of the of the entire structure uh, is is key for us also to bring and 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 get down to 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 a lower uh, consumption on the on the building itself and and this is almost true for the data centers uh, 
of course a lot of progress also has been made uh, the past uh, the past decades uh, on the data center area of course it's a growing uh, it's a growing area of course it will continue to grow thanks to uh, new also uh, projects coming out like the intelligence uh, artificial intelligence uh, autonomous cars whatever 5g we know that it will bring uh, also some new needs in terms of infrastructure uh, we will also connect uh, some products uh, through the edge uh, and and we will have also bigger data centers on top of this so of course this will continue to grow and we absolutely have to control uh, the the energy consumption uh, of these uh, data centers and we we do have today some solutions and on, on top of all of this I'm also part of, of some uh, European groups uh, and one is the uh, the coordination group of green data centers the CGGDC uh, where we, we also started to build some years ago uh, what we call the code of conduct uh, for data centers it's been initiated in 2008 so 12 years ago and if we if we look back in the past uh, the, the progress we made in terms of uh, power consumptions and we speak a lot about the PUE power usage effectiveness uh, if we go to the next slide please we, we have a, we have a nice uh, a nice example of what can we done or of what can we do sorry um, and, and we have this uh, this example for, for Telefonica in Spain this is one of the largest uh, data center in Europe uh, third in the world we've been working with them uh, for their new data center uh, to, to also create from the beginning uh, a solution with the lowest possible PUE still of course leaving some room to improve uh, if, if we compare for example the PUE that we have today in Telefonica Spain uh, between 1.3 to 1.4 uh, if we go back in the past in 2006 a typical data center PUE was around 1.8 uh, and and we've we've been doing some continuous improvements thanks to the solutions we provide but also thanks to the guidance and best practices we also promote in this code of conduct for data center we've been able to improve uh, continuously uh, and reduce the PUE and now we can also even reach uh, for the, the highest end once 1.1 uh, uh, thanks to all the guidance we are able to provide and solutions we have uh, and, and this is a great example of what can be done uh, this is a big 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 one so of course uh, the power consumption is, is can be quite high uh, we, we can have sometimes uh, tens of megawatt of IT products installed but in terms of power consumption we are also able to optimize and reduce uh, as much as we can the um, the power consumption uh, thanks to the connected products we have and the control uh, we, we can we can have on it uh, through the through the software suites that we have uh, which is called the uh, echo structure for data center so we, we can really help our customers to improve uh, their uh, their consumptions and, and reduce them and save uh, as maximum as possible uh, the co2 uh, level we can also have uh, some specific solutions to include and integrate uh, renewable energies uh, productions on top of this uh, of this uh, of these solutions more and more customers now are including solar panels wind turbines we also have some solutions to uh, to include this and this will come also on top of the guidance and best practices we can propose uh, for for this uh, for for these uh, customers uh, if we go to the next uh, uh, slide please so we are we are also committed to improve sustainability uh, sustainability for us means that uh, we also want our products thanks to the software solutions we provide we want our products to last as much as possible uh, we also we also bring some new solutions uh, like for example if you speak about the data centers 
and the energy storage we we have uh, we have in it uh, we've been the first uh, on, on the market uh, four years ago in 2016 uh, to propose for example lithium ion batteries as a storage for data centers uh, we, we we all know that uh, this can bring a lot of advantages compared to the traditional uh, lead acid batteries that were used in terms of lifetime and in terms of sustainability uh, it's also uh, been uh, you know it's it's been easy to do because of the of the grow of the electric cars uh, clearly uh, but we've been the first on the market doing this uh, and we we can also propose on top of this thanks to this new storage for example uh, new services also to support the grid so there's a lot of interaction uh, and, and this can help for sure saving a lot of energies and co2 uh, but it it can also bring additional services to the to the grid and and we see this uh, and, and the the big grow in, in terms of, uh, of, of services in, in many countries in Europe. Uh, it's true for Nordic countries, uh, but it's also true for, for some of the countries like Germany, UK, France, uh, and, and we see this now more and more uh, today. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So how to ensure uh, strong, stronger convergence uh, between uh, what we call sustainability and digital. Uh, we, we also have to promote digital tools for sure. We, we saw that 24% of the savings can be achieved uh, through a better control uh, through the digital systems. Uh, to, to, to optimize also uh, the data centers in terms of decarbonization, uh, we also have to promote very strongly uh, the, the code of conduct for data centers. Uh, we speak about the power usage effectiveness, but we also have a lot of different uh, metrics uh, within this, uh, this, uh, this code of conduct. Uh, there's a lot of guidance, a lot of best, best practices. Uh, so it's not only about the power usage effectiveness, but the, this, one, this one is a key and quite a common one and, and, and known one, but there is also some other ones uh, related to, uh, to, to water, for example. Uh, we, we also have to um, we, we also have to promote uh, innovation, education, uh, to, to, to also continue this uh, construction of, of what we call smart buildings, and this is also for sure applicable to, to, to data centers. Uh, so that, that's 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 a, that's what I would say, uh, and then on on top of it, and on top of all of this, and it is really transverse. It's not only applicable to data centers, but uh, we also have to promote the use of uh, renewable energies, uh, the use of waste heat. Uh, we also have some examples uh, of the waste heat generated by the data centers uh, that can be reused uh, to heat. Uh, buildings uh, or to heat uh, swimming pools, whatever. We, we, we also have to promote uh, all of this because this can also help saving both energies and, uh, and, and CO2. That's, uh, that's, that's what I have on my side. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I went a bit fast, uh, but if you have any questions, just, uh, just let me know. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And uh, okay. now we we are not very late, so everything is fine <laughs> for the moment. Thank you. I would like well, we only have five minutes uh, delay, but you know we can survive that. So I think I can give now the floor to the next speaker, which is Andreas Herbst, which is a senior researcher from uh, Fraunhofer. Uh, and uh, please, uh, you, you have the floor and uh, he will talk to us about the options for achieving a close to climate neutral EU industry and their implication is a major, major point. Please, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, so maybe we can just go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, I'm Andrea Herbst. I'm researcher at Fraunhofer ISI in Karlsruhe and we are doing since more than 10 years research, applied research, on the decarbonization of the industry sector, including energy efficiency, fuel switch, but also the more uh, difficult emissions to mitigate until 2050. And we do a lot of research for the European Commission and also for the Umweltbundesamt in Germany. But anyhow, this lecture is a little bit more abstract as we look into the future until 2050 and how we can achieve a climate 
neutral industry. So next slide, please. Thank you. So currently, industry accounts for around 25% of industrial final energy demand, and it mainly uses gas, electricity, coal, and oil as energy carriers. And if we look in the sector, then we see that final energy demand of the industry sector is strongly dominated by energy intensive industries, as you all know, for example, like the steel industry, but also the chemical industry. And even though there are already some industry, like for example, the paper industry that use a lot of electricity and biomass, it, the industry sector is currently not right on track to decarbonize until 2050, as well as current policies not right on track. So there still need to be uh, strong uh, changes in the sector that have to be carried out until 2050. Next slide, please. So when we look at today's available technology, we also see that these are probably not sufficient for deep decarbonization until 2050. So on this slide here, you see the EU emissions from the industrial sector for the year 2015. And we see that there are a variety of different challenges. So for example, in terms of end users, around 50% of the emissions stem from high temperature process heat in furnaces, or an additional 20% from high temperature steam and hot water. So here we also have the challenge that, for example, in the furnaces, the use of renewable energy is restricted due to technical restrictions and the high temperature needs. So we can only use biomass or secondary energy carriers like electricity and hydrogen. Another 20% of the emissions are process emissions, which are emissions from chemical reactions within the production process. And these are even harder to mitigate with today's available technologies or at current level impossible to mitigate. So we see that uh, here uh, um, energy efficiency and fuel switch are very important pillars for the decarbonization of the sector, especially until 2030. But in the long term, we will need um, innovative breakthrough technologies to decarbonize the sector until 2050. Next slide, please. So currently there are a lot of breakthrough technologies under development, but they differ very strongly in uh, maturity and distance to market. And so here we have some examples, for example, new low carbon products, like here you see, for example, concrete that absorbs CO2 via, via, while curing, but also, for example, replacing steel, uh, in, the, in the carbon concrete with carbon nanofibers, but also the use of uh, secondary energy carriers in the iron and steel industry, either the use of direct electricity or the use of hydrogen. Yeah, so you can click again if you like. Yeah, thank you. But also the use of new raw materials, for example, in the paper industry, where you use grass fibers instead of wood fibers. And also a very important part uh, topic is the, the topic of feedstock in the chemical industry, for example, if you click please, where you uh, substitute, for example, um, fossil based feedstock with renewable hydrogen to produce uh, hydrogen based methanol, which can then be used to produ produce olefins. So you somehow have carbon neutral plastics. So there's a very big var variety of uh, technologies and products that are currently developed, but it's at the moment it's not completely clear which will be successful and which will enter the market in time to uh, support uh, deep decarbonization of the sector. So uh, thank you. What we did in our research, and I'm not talking too much about the methodology we used, so you can read this later uh, in, in our reports, but we looked at three different scenarios. We had a reference case, which more or less reflects the current policy situation right now and the historic trends. We have the best available technology scenario. And here, the most important point is that we assume a complete diffusion of today's best available energy efficiency technologies. And we had a look at a 95% scenario, 95 scenario, reduction scenario. So what would we need to achieve carbon neutrality or near carbon neutrality in the industry sector until 2050? And there, really, we need all clusters of mitigation options. So really, 
best available technology and innovative efficiency improvements, but also new processes and products, low carbon processes and products, fuel switch to renewable energies and secondary energy carriers, CCS in a very limited way here, only for process emissions that are very hard to mitigate, and also actions on the downstream side of the sector, so more recycling and higher material efficiency. So these are more or less three pathways we looked at. And in the next slide, you see uh, the first results. So what we see is that this very high level of ambition we assume in our 95% scenario, which is on the very right, enables a very high CO2 emissions reduction. So from a technological perspective, if all these um, new technologies enter the market in time, then industry will be able to become nearly carbon neutral. But if we see in comparison, the uh, scenario in the middle, if we deploy only best available technologies and fuel switch, which is driven by energy carrier prices, then we will have a very substantial gap to, to achieve carbon neutrality. So in the best available uh, technology scenario, we achieve around an emission reduction of 35%, while in the um, carbon neutral scenario, we can achieve an emission reduction of 93% compared to 2015. And the best available technology scenario is mainly driven by energy efficiency, fuel switch, and a little bit more secondary production in the steel industry. While for the carbon neutral scenario, we really need everything. Low carbon innovations, a very ambitious material efficiency and circular economy world, uh, hydrogen as energy carrier and feedstock, and also electricity for process heat. Thank you. Next slide, please. But when we look you have, at that, Sorry yeah. for interrupting, Andrea. You have about four minutes. Uh, four to five minutes to finish. Yeah, I know. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, concerning energy demand, we see that the reduction is uh, less pronounced. So in both scenarios, the best available technology scenario and the 95% um, scenario, we see that electricity becomes the dominant energy carrier. However, carbon neutrality can only be achieved if we also substitute the remaining natural gas in the sector using, for example, synthetic methane. And we have a nearly complete uh, coal and oil phase out, which is only possible if we replace technologies before the end of lifetime. Next slide, please. And another important point here is that if we substitute our chemical feedstocks with renewable hydrogen based feedstocks, then we see that we will have an additional hydrogen demand in the industry sector, which is then now energy demand of 480 terawatt hours. So 480 terawatt hours will be needed as hydrogen only for feedstock purposes. So what we see in the perspective, next slide is, next, you know, that, um, Renewable electricity generation is really a central enabler for uh, achieving climate neutrality in the industry sector. If we do not want to use CCS and biomass in a very substantial way. So we see here in the 95 scenario, we have nearly a tripling of the electricity demand for hydrogen feedstock uses for the generation of clean gas and also for the electrification of the process heat. So here we have really a very big challenge to, to provide and make affordable these large volumes of renewable electricity that will be needed in the industry sector. Next slide, thank you. So what we see is that available technologies are very important pillars for the uh, medium term decarbonization of the sector. However, to, to deep to decarbonize the EU industry until 2050, they will not be sufficient. There are already a lot of innovations under development and under the way, but they differ strongly in maturity and distance to market. So there's still a lot of efforts to do. We can achieve more than 80% um, greenhouse gas emission reduction without CCS. Yes, of course, but we need these innovations. We need CO2 free energy carriers hydrogen and electricity, and we also need innovations on the demand side concerning material efficiency and uh, circular economy. And of course, all this is 
only possible if we have a supportive regulatory and policy framework. So if we achieve to establish markets for these products that are often in uh, global competition, that we uh, provide security for industry, for example, by a minimum uh, CO2 floor price path. So there's really a lot of effort to do also on the policy side to make this uh, transition happen. Next slide, please. So uh, thank you very much. And of course, this was a lot of information in a very short time. So if you're interested in reading how we did it and what we else, we, else we did, because we did a lot of uh, more scenarios, then you have here two um, reports from the Umwelt Bundesamt and also what we did for the European Commission. And you can read a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you to you, Andrea. It's, uh, it's indeed a lot, uh, a lot of information. And, uh, and really, um, you can see here, actually, this is quite useful, the uh, main messages of the, three, uh, of the three speakers that we just had in front of us. And now we will go on uh, with uh, an interesting um, part of our, of our webinar. And this is uh, the reaction of our four next uh, panelists. Um, which will be a short reaction because they will come in uh, afterwards with the question and answers um, on uh, the reaction and inputs uh, from uh, what you heard, basically. And uh, I would like to welcome and um, give the floor to our first uh, uh, panelist, which is Anti Valle uh, from the European Commission, DG Grow. Anti, you have the floor. Uh, just a second, I, I turn my uh, video on. Yeah, I also had the, not my video, I just realized that. <laughs> Can you see me? Yes. Um, okay, you can see and hear me. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, so I, I will actually continue from where uh, Andrea just, uh, just uh, concluded that uh, that uh, we we certainly uh, the basis is is to have the, the um, uh, stable and in a, in enabling uh, policy framework uh, conditions. So uh, uh, so the uh, return on investment is is of course imperative uh, for for industries to 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 make this investment. Uh, so so uh, it, it it is imperative that uh, there is a demand and there's market uh, for for these low carbon products. And, and, and uh, for these investments, these stable conditions are are, are needed. Um, also, what, what's what's necessary is is that uh, uh, the companies have uh, options uh, available on the market. So uh, it's it's also in in our common interest to to help uh, to develop, uh, demonstrate, and and and, and, and uh, by this to help to deploy these these uh, new solutions. But uh, to your question, what uh, what's in, in pipeline in, in DG Grow uh, for decarbonizing industry? Uh, are there any specific measures? Uh, I would like first to mention that um, that um, uh, we've been working on, on, on these questions uh, for for many years, of course, uh, and uh, uh, last year. Um, the high level group on energy intensive uh, industries uh, published is its its recommendations regarding the these industries uh, trans transformation uh, uh, um, towards uh, climate neutrality the, the so-called uh, 2050 transformation master plan so that 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 was that that, that provided uh, um, uh, some shared uh, vision uh, on, on, on the possible pathways towards uh, climate neutrality. Uh, the industry was very much involved in, in, in drafting these recommendations, but also a number of, of NGOs, member states, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, 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 it was a balanced exercise. And uh, we were happy to notice that uh, this this uh, new commission uh, recognized the value of, of this work and, and it's reflected uh, in, in Green Deal, uh, which uh, which uh, from a need grow point of view uh, we we see it as, as as a growth strategy because it involves uh, um, uh, 
um, huge investment uh, in, in, in various fields. Um, but also uh, these ideas are reflected in, in the uh, communication on new industrial policy, uh, which, which uh, has, has these um, um, two, uh, two dimension transformation to climate neutrality and, and digitalization as, as uh, key drivers. Uh, what's, what's new uh, in uh, this industrial strategy compared to, to the previous ones is, is the ecosystemic uh, approach, uh, which means that a, a more uh, comprehensive uh, um, view to, 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 to the uh, complex uh, economic issues uh, and trying to understand the role and value of, of, of various types of, of players. So it's, it's, it's extended from a value chain approach, uh, which, is, which is more, uh, let's say, industry player specific. And, 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 and now uh, we try to comprise the, the role of uh, uh, innovate, innovation um, um, players uh, and, and, and uh, public sector and, and, and NGOs and so on and so forth. And um, uh, where all this uh, is realized, here we come to, to more to the specific measures, uh, are the industrial uh, alliances. So in industrial alliances uh, um, are um, uh, try, trying to, to uh, use the best practice of uh, the battery alliance, which has been very successful in, in uh, pulling uh, together uh, interested partners uh, to, to, to foster development in, in, in the field of uh, sustainable batteries in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, now this, this model um, uh, will, will be introduced to, 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 to um, tackle other uh, needs as well. Uh, just today, uh, um, the Industry Alliance on, on Clean Hydrogen will be launched later today or maybe during uh, while we speak. Um, um, but also other, other alliances uh, are under development, uh, like Auntie, one on... Auntie, yeah. I am sorry for interrupting you, but uh, you actually jumped to the next stage already. <laughs> this first part was simply to have a quick reaction to what the panelists, to what the previous speakers said. Sorry. And then I was going to ask you about what's in the pipeline. So you already answered uh, half of it, but I just wanted to sorry. ask you if you had any kind of then quick reaction to, to what uh, okay. uh, our speakers said. And, uh, and then I will, of course, sorry for interrupting you, but just to... to, to uh, no, no. To, uh, to, uh, to be able to, to allow you actually to go on with your uh, longer, let's say, uh, intervention oh, later okay. on. But if you perhaps Very have a, quick, uh, quest, uh, a reaction to what you heard from our first three uh, interventions, and then we will uh, move to, the, to, the, to, uh, to a pool, and then I will uh, uh, allow you to, uh, to finish uh, the, the, this part. I'm sorry for interrupting, but... Uh, but just no, 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 no. Because we Thank you for, for your clarification. Do you have any reaction to, to what you heard? Very good. Thanks. So the question is, do you have any reaction to what you heard from the three earlier panelists? It disappeared, but you have the floor. Uh, sorry, it's still for, still for me? Uh, yes, yes, I just me? wanted to know if you have any kind of quick reaction to uh, what you heard. Uh, well, I, 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 I reacted already to, to, to Andrea. So, so um, yes, I, I just don't want to reinforce her message. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will give you the floor later to go on with the program of DG Growth. Thank you very much. So now, uh, Jan uh, um, Champer from uh, DG um, Energy from the European Commission. Same question. If you have any kind of reaction to any of the speakers you heard, and then we will go to the specific uh, uh, question that I will ask you later. Yes. Uh, thank Jan, you. you. Thank you very floor. much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, just to briefly introduce myself, uh, I am part of the Energy Efficiency Unit, Policy and Financing, and I am responsible for energy efficiency in industry and heating and cooling policy. 
and uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for the interesting presentations. Uh, just to quickly uh, uh, react, uh, I think uh, I'm very glad to hear all these uh, suggestions and recommendations, and I feel like uh, we we meet uh, we meet uh, halfway because, uh, as uh, you may know. Um, the European Commission will adopt today the energy system integration strategy and also the hydrogen strategy, which will to a large extent uh, uh, try to address uh, these challenges that you presented and uh, will come up with uh, potential actions to, to solve uh, uh, the issue that we are uh, encountering. And also we are preparing a renovation wave, which uh, we we'll, uh, look deeply into the uh, building renovation uh, approach, and uh, certainly there is uh, there is a space that we could uh, uh, incorporate your input on the industrial uh, insulation. Uh, and uh, to to complement and to maybe give a give a little bit uh, uh, of overview what uh, we are uh, uh, are doing in in these terms, uh, not to come uh, come with the uh, with the plan activities, but to stress how important industry is, we did uh, uh, an, an analysis and in our projections in line with the current energy efficiency and renewable targets, uh, the European industry would uh, alone uh, need to reduce its final energy consumption by approximately 30 megatons of oil equivalent between 2020 and 2030. And this would account for 17% of the total uh, reduction needed to reach the 2030 target. And uh, uh, in order to uh, ensure this uh, consumption is reduced, we need to tap into the existing energy efficiency potential. And the, in line with our uh, yet preliminary data, uh, the cost effective energy savings potential in industry in 2030 is at approximately 60 megatons of oil equivalent, which is basically the, the double energy savings that are needed. And uh, the, uh, just to conclude, this is uh, economic saving potential, which is very close to its technical potential and the, the sectors and the industrial branch is leading the list of the potential is chemical and petrochemical, of course, and iron and steel coming up uh, with uh, food and drink industry and uh, et, et cetera. So this is uh, just a brief, uh, brief, uh, Thank you. Brief introduction from my side. Later. Thank you so Thanks. much for uh, this quick reaction. So, for, and then now I would like to uh, uh, to give the floor to uh, Guido Knoche, or Guido Knoche, as, uh, as you say in, uh, in German, from uh, um, from the German Environmental Agency. Please, you have the floor for a quick reaction before the question later. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I that's can't nice. see you. I mean, I cannot see you, but probably it's me. But uh, I will. I hear you very well. Yes, now I see you as well. Yeah, my video should work. I think. Um, yes, it does. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, there are very nice and interesting information about what would be possible and what is going on in in different sectors and and on different levels. Uh, let me just to be quick, uh, very uh, shortly uh, react on that what Andreas was saying with this, uh, very, for me, very impressive uh, presentation on, uh, on potential in, the, in regard to industrial uh, insulation from a practitioner's side. And uh, I just remember this, uh, this number where he said uh, that um, uh, one could save around uh, 45 million tons of CO2 per year when moving from one standard to a, uh, to a higher level standard. Um, and just to, to give you an impression of what uh, is needed in regard to getting uh, a climate neutral and uh, uh, with a uh, milestone 2030, you know, the, uh, you are aware of the discussions on uh, raising the EU climate ambition, also um, uh, brought in by the Commission with its uh, climate target plan and the Commission proposal to reduce emissions to around 50, uh, minus 50 to 55 percent. When we would like to reach this level, and, and from my scientific perspective, you can imagine that we even would go further this level, what the Commission is uh, currently proposing. Um, this number, 45 megatons per year, would be a, a significant share of that what the EU as a whole 
would need to do in regard to saving emissions. And um, this is the, the one point. And the other point, just uh, to, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be honest, my guess on that uh, poll, what, uh, which Andreas raised, I was thinking about 10,000 kilometers and uh, this, uh, this number of 20,000 kilometers is a, um, a very huge number. So uh, for me, I would say I could drive another car uh, with this uh, potential of uh, saving energy. Um, yeah, and, and for me, it's a, a little bit, um, how to say, um, good to see that um, many people are thinking about, on the one side, uh, looking at sectoral uh, um, uh, initiatives in regard to what could be done on the sectoral level. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, your, say, uh, demands to the policy that uh, uh, we need, a, or you as practitioners need a, a, a framework which enables you uh, to, to get these, uh, f uh, these uh, emission savings. And this, of course, is a very interesting right now. You know, Germany has now the uh, EU presen uh, uh, presidency and my point of view is not necessarily that one what the uh, uh, German government is saying, but at the end, um, uh, with the Commission's uh, Green Deal initiative, it seems that there is a very ambitious uh, plan uh, throughout Europe and, of course, the German government, I think, will uh, support this. And uh, the, the, to, to find the, uh, a good um, balance between man mandatory regulations and also incentives for practitioners like industries are needed in this overall um, framework. So I leave it with this. Uh, thank you for, for the first time. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Barbara Mariani, who is uh, a senior policy officer uh, for climate of, from the uh, European Environmental Quick answer thank you. at least action to watch. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for inviting the European Environmental Bureau uh, to this debate, um, and so uh, I would like to react uh, as you asked uh, to the previous uh, speakers. Uh, and uh, actually, thank you very much for very uh, three very interesting presentations. And I, I took some notes on on some of the issues which really resonate. Uh, our our thinking with regard to how to decarbonize industry and which I will uh, develop further uh, in the second part of, uh, of the debate um, and uh, first of all uh, regarding uh, what Andreas said about uh, um, insulation in industry but also uh, regarding what, uh, what has been said about uh, about uh, uh, the need for more energy efficiency and uh, fuel switch by by Andrea. Uh, so the the first issue that is really common to all the three uh, um, visions is that there is a lot of untapped potential out there uh, to increase energy efficiency in industry, and this untapped potential uh, will not be. Uh, uh, will not be used unless we. Uh, put in place the, 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 the right regulatory framework, meaning that uh, uh, there is a, really a need for um, uh, more regulation with regard to energy efficiency in industry and overall, uh, an overall comprehensive strategy on how to tackle this uh, in, in the different sectors, uh, uh, which te technologies are there, uh, which solutions are already there, to be used and how to make these requirements uh, mandatory. Um, I will talk later about uh, the policy options we have and uh, how much we can do just by revising some regulation or tightening some regulations which are already there. So untapped potential is really the key uh, issue here because uh, uh, it is true that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, of these uh, changes in in, in industry uh, processes um, are, are 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 costly, are expensive. But uh, it is also true that uh, 
uh, it's a good investment in order to reduce energy consumption and to reduce energy bills, uh, and therefore it really pays back. And plus, there, is, there are lots of um, financial resources, especially now, to be used and to be channeled towards this, uh, uh, these improvements. And um, also, I was really uh, happy to, to hear that Andreas uh, underlined how the highest ambition, uh, highest uh, uh, climate ambition will, will help uh, to reduce emissions in a, in, a, in, a, in a faster way because it will really um, drive uh, more action uh, now, which is what we, we, we need at the moment. So I would like to, to stop here because uh, uh, maybe later on uh, I will have more time to, to go a bit more in depth into each, uh, each topic, if you want. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now we have a Zoom uh, pool. Uh, and the question that, um, that we are going to ask, you see there, which approach should the EU prioritize to support um, industry decarbonization, mainly regulatory approach or mainly voluntary scheme? So the poll is open, you can, uh, uh, you can vote. And I would like now to go to uh, some questions who are sort of uh, policy, uh, policy debate, also to our panelists. Um, and uh, I will uh, start with uh, Antti Valle from DigiGrow, and uh, he already started to answer what is in the pipeline uh, um, as far as, as, as DigiGrow is um, concerning for the decarbonizing industry. Um, and that specific question was to understand whether there were some uh, specific uh, measures uh, to promote energy and resource efficiency in industry. And this will be the same question uh, for, uh, Jan, uh, uh, for Jan later on. So Antti, you, uh, you already started to answer, but please uh, do conclude uh, or go on. And then I will give the floor to Jan to answer the same question. Thank you, Monica. Uh, so, uh, sorry for starting lecturing in, in the first place. Uh, I, will, I will just finish. Uh, uh, I come back to, to, to the ecosystem. Anti, we can hear you very badly. I don't know what's going on. First, you, you, were, you were perfect, and now it's a bit strange. Uh, is it better now? Is it better now? Hello? Yes, please go on. Now it's good. It's good. Ah, okay, okay. I don't know what, what's, what's, uh, what's the problem, but uh, let's try. Uh, so, um, I, I, will, I will finish uh, what, what I was um, uh, talking about, uh, ecosystem approach, uh, where the, the industry alliances are, are, are the, the instruments for that, uh, one of them. Uh, so, um, this, this, is, this is the attempt of, uh, of uh, DG Grow um, to... Um, push for, for coalitions uh, of willing uh, to, to deliver um, joint action in these fields, as has happened with the, with the um, battery ecosystem. And uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Clean Hydrogen Alliance will be launched uh, today, and, and we are working on, on other alliances, like one on, on raw materials and another one on... on um, Low carbon industries. Um, these uh, alliances, there's, there's been quite a lot of discussion around the, the governance of these uh, alliances. Uh, we see that uh, they, uh, we, we, we need to ensure the, the uh, industry interest that because it's, it is about investments and, and, and pooling resources. So, um, uh, but um, uh, right after issue ensuring this we we need to be them to be inclusive and and, and open for all interested party to 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 uh, to join uh, we we wish to ensure good connection with the member states and and, and with a with a civil uh, society as well uh, then just a quick word on on recovery plan which is of course still uh, very much unclear how what 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 it will will mean in in practice? We know the Commission proposal, but uh, but uh, what will come out of that? Uh, but assuming that there will there will be a significant uh, uh, financing channeled through the member states, uh, 
the Commission wants to 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 help uh, the member state to I identify, uh, let's say, relevant projects, uh, uh, relevant uh, um, targets for for investments uh, with 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 a, a high uh, societal and and, and uh, environmental values. So. Um, uh, we have asked uh, the indus industries uh, to come up with with their project pipelines, uh, explaining uh, where is 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 the need for uh, risk sharing and, uh, and and why uh, how how these projects uh, would um, uh, promote uh, uh, the sustainability targets or just transition targets or other other common targets. So just, just, just to, to, to explain our role in, in this. Uh, thank you. Kitos, I must say uh, that uh, there is some, uh, let's say, some worry in the uh, energy efficiency community about this uh, issue of the emphasis given to hydrogen. Um, because, of course, we see it in some cases a bit um, competing uh, with, uh, with the resources given to energy efficiency and also uh, to the ideas that uh, maybe it's not only the green hydrogen that should be pushed, but also other kind of hydrogen. So just to flag that, um, of course, this is an important thing, but um, there are some, also some worries that... Uh, that uh, um, this idea that hydrogen is so important would hide some of the in interesting and very important potential that, for example, Andreas and the others, and Gael and others spoke about. So I, I really would like to urge the DigiGrow in particular to be attentive to uh, the message given by this, um, by this webinar that, that there are also uh, extremely important uh, potential to be taken into account and to be helped uh, that are uh, referring not to hydrogen but uh, uh, to other uh, sectors as as you as you as you as you heard so i hope that this message will uh, will come uh, very strong uh, very strong and clear um, it, so, um, I, I, I can confirm it has come 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 across very strong and i, I just want to mention that uh, when uh, this alliance will be launched today uh, there will be a website where all, all interested can register as, as um, uh, partners in, the, in this uh, alliance and, and will be uh, fully informed. Kitos, thank you very much. So Jan, you have the floor on the same question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, and I, I think to, to be able to answer your question, uh, we need to look at the barriers and uh, the barriers were already identified by the speakers, but uh, we also did a series of roundtables with industry who identified list of barriers. And on top of the list is the lack of awareness of the potential energy savings. This was also mentioned by Andreas in his presentation. And also this, uh, this is followed by economic barriers such as low availability of financing or a uh, low return of, uh, on investments. And I believe uh, this uh, will be addressed by the the recovery package and the great uh, emphasis on energy transition in this package. Um, uh, but I believe and in most cases that uh, we have already uh, a toolbox of measures that could tackle most of these challenges. Uh, but we need to ensure that they are effectively implemented throughout the EU and strengthen if uh, necessary. Uh, on the on the question on what is in the pipeline in DGN, uh, one of the foreseen uh, actions in the European Green Deal is uh, the review and uh, potential revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive, as you may know, together with uh, the Renewable Energy Directive uh, by June 2021. Uh, the Commission will take the decision about the revision in the context of increasing the 2030 climate ambition to at least 50 or 55 percent. Uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive review would also allow for identifying uh, uh, additional measures needed uh, to uh, ensure the 2030 energy efficiency targets is reached uh, and uh, if uh, the so-called ambition gap uh, is closed. Uh, 
And to give you a quick insight in the pr procedural aspects uh, that might be relevant for the participants, uh, we will launch uh, and publish uh, the evaluation roadmap of the Energy Efficiency Directive soon uh, on the Have Your Say uh, website of the Commission. And uh, you will, you are very welcome to aim, uh, to come up with the input and ideas about the evaluation of the directive. Uh, later after the summer, we will organize expert workshops and a larger stakeholder event uh, for uh, for the industry associations and the member states. This will be done in September through October, and uh, this will be divided into uh, topics uh, covered by the ED review, such as heating and cooling, industry, uh, etc. And and at a later stage in October, we will also publish a public consultation. Uh, that will cover questions both related to the ED review and evaluation of the uh, existing provisions, but also we'll touch upon the uh, more forward-looking questions about the potential revision and the need to revise uh, in order to meet our targets. Uh, uh, on the ED uh, process itself and what we are doing currently, we are developing ideas for the potential revision inside the GNR. And uh, in this regard, uh, I, I think it would be interesting to mention two areas that uh, could be relevant for this session. Uh, first, uh, and touching upon uh, the presentation uh, from Gael on data centers, we are looking at uh, the issue of waste heat in industry and the ICT sector. And as you may know, uh, the European Green Deal communication emphasizes the importance of uh, greater sustainability of the ICT sector. And uh, the Commission envisaged in the communication to consider measures to improve energy efficiency and circular economy performance of the ITC, ICT sector and data centers in, in particular. Having said that, uh, the energy system integration that I mentioned earlier that is being published today, uh, the Commission uh, is looking into the largely unused potential of waste heat in industry and ICT sector and will uh, propose actions uh, to, to utilize this potential mostly through the potential revision of the uh, ED and Renewable Energy Directive. And uh, the, the second area uh, is, of course, the energy audit obligation in line with uh, Article 8 of the Energy Efficiency Directive. Uh, here, the, we are looking at the possibilities how to uh, streamline the obligation and make it more, let's say, ha make it um, have it more impact uh, in terms of uh, implementation of the, the recommendations. Because as you may know, these recommendations uh, are not uh, binding for the for the companies and we are looking at possibilities how to incentivize uh, member states or, or the companies to actually carry carry out uh, these recommendations as we think there is a great potential in in this area and i think i'll for this time i will conclude with this Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. And uh, we move now to uh, Guido Knoche. And uh, of course, Germany is, uh, is a very key country with a very large uh, industrial structure. And um, could you please share one or two success stories and uh, also some plans from the new, near future in this uh, specific area, Guido? And you have to unmute your phone. You are a microphone. Now you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, Germany is a, has a key role to play in all these deliberations. And um, yes, I can understand there are great uh, expectations uh, towards Germany to generate a strong momentum to overcoming this uh, um, the, the, the current situation, but also the current crisis mode in which we are, please do not forget this. Um, and also in particular, of course, uh, the businesses are uh, affected uh, too roughly about this. But um, yeah, let me just give you two points in advance to my thoughts I will share with you. Just to reiterate, I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of the German government. And, uh, and secondly, 
we should reconsider um, all these uh, uh, this uh, global pandemic situation when talking about success stories, but because many things we are having now have been elaborated, have been implemented beforehand this pandemic. And uh, from my perspective, uh, we have an extraordinary uh, situation with uh, diverse implications, uh, in particular also to our way of life. So my perspective is maybe a little bit different from that, what, what uh, the colleagues already said, but uh, uh, from my view, uh, we have to rethink our uh, way of life. Uh, and this is uh, also in regard to the climate crisis. And um, this is, um, in that sense, important to understand because uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic is more or less a short-term issue, whereas uh, the climate uh, question, the climate crisis, will have uh, long-term implications uh, on the global life uh, all over the world. But uh, let me now come to your particular questions. In regard to uh, initiatives, in regard to developments, uh, which uh, keep me somehow optimistic. Um, and uh, there, let me give you three examples. The Commission, uh, uh, the commission uh, colleagues, uh, Jan and Nanti, are already uh, here, have already uh, worked, uh, were elaborated as, uh, parts of uh, the work program of the uh, Commission, but I would like to, to add from a climate perspective, two very important issues in regard to climate neutrality, but also in regard to raising the ambition in the time horizon 2030. And you know, all you know that there is a climate law under discussion right now already in the, uh, in the parliament, but also uh, the climate target plan, which means uh, the, uh, the commission or the European Union as a whole is planning to revise its, its current climate target for, for 2030 and this will somehow end uh, 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 will be completed uh, during the German pre presidency maybe uh, it's uh, for me it's currently not that clear but um, uh, more or less the whole world is waiting on the European Union so uh, we are um, uh, waiting for this uh, for first uh, this um, uh, impact assessment by the Commission, with, which uh, will uh, give very rough information on all issues regarding uh, raising climate uh, targets, but also uh, raising the ambition in regard, for example, to the uh, energy efficiency in industries. And this is a sort of so a short term. And as Andreas already uh, outlined, that there are uh, huge potentials in uh, for example, in insulation of uh, industry uh, uh, devices. Um, yeah, and also that uh, uh, Jan already elaborated upcoming uh, processes uh, in reviewing the energy directive uh, are making me um, yeah, curious on the one hand and uh, also getting more optimistic that on European level will be, will happen um, uh, um, uh, um, a way or will happen a way forward to getting a tighten a, a tighten our, um, climate targets second my second point would be the german uh, presidency uh, some call call it even a corona presidency uh, will somehow try to pick up these uh, topics you have seen the program uh, of the, the official program of the german government to the presidency so uh, I think there will be um, there will be a big relation, of course, to uh, to overcome the Corona pa pandemic, and this will uh, somehow work together with uh, the recovery plan uh, proposed by the Commission. And of course, there is uh, much money underway to 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 give the right incentives, but also to enable. Uh, a, a broad range of stakeholders to do more on the on the recovery on the one hand, but on the other hand, somehow to bring uh, environmental issues, also this climate issue, in thinking how to get uh, the econ economy getting running again. Um, my. Uh,
my last point uh, re re uh, relates to the to the business sector itself. Uh, many of you, or all of you, will know that the uh, uh, international agents, energy agency, and the in international monetary fund have uh, just recently uh, published their sustainable recovery special report, in which they uh, figure out a recovery plan for for the, the, the for many business sectors and uh, what what from from this uh, um, uh, analysis uh, came up is that we can already have achieved this global energy peak which means uh, on the other hand uh, emissions greenhouse gas emissions may have um, may find a way downwards what we uh, urgently urgently need when getting uh, wanting to get climate neutral by 2050 at the latest of course uh, this is uh, um, um, uh, the, the plan is focused on uh, cost effective measures but uh, it uh, could already be um, implemented within a time frame of the next three years ahead. And this uh, um, is for the current situation in which uh, the, the, the industry or the business sectors are uh, also a big signal, a good signal to get, uh, to get, uh, to, to get this challenge running in, in their sentence. And with this, I close for right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Guido. I just must say that uh, we were a little bit uh, worried, as you may imagine, by the fact that uh, energy efficient was, uh, efficiency in buildings in particular was given no basic presence in the, in the program. And uh, I hope that this uh, does not mean that there is little attention for this uh, element and I know that you don't represent the government, but just to say that uh, uh, although the, 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 the program was quite uh, uh, interesting and very ambitious, this part was a little bit uh, missing, at least uh, for, for us. And I would like to ask uh, to Barbara uh, Mariani from EB, um, where do you think that uh, uh, we should focus uh, and where is the largest potential to save energy uh, and reduce emission in industry? You already started to, uh, to answer to that, but uh, perhaps you can go a little bit uh, more in, uh, in, uh, in detail and then we will see if you have uh, some little minutes uh, over our time to answer some of the questions that arrived. Barbara, you have the floor, thank you. Yes, thank you, Monica. Uh, I would like to start, first of all, saying that uh, most of uh, all uh, of uh, what um, Guido said is shared by us, clearly. Uh, first of all, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the question of whether we should uh, uh, keep uh, our climate ambition very high despite the COVID, because the COVID has shown that we need uh, to invest in a more resilient uh, uh, future uh, economy and therefore and climate change will not disappear once we have uh, tackled the, the health emergency. It will still remain the, the one of the biggest challenges of, of, of our century. So um, our um, main uh, uh, request to the German presidents is that of uh, um, increasing the short-term ambition as much as possible. We, we, we call for a 65% minus emission reduction by 2030, accompanied by a higher energy, target, energy efficiency target up to 45% and a higher renewable energy target up to 50% all by 2030. Why? Because as I said before, there is a lot of untapped potential and uh, um, uh, we need to uh, act now because the, the, the climate emergency is, is serious and the IPCC, the UNEP reports have highlighted that we really need to reduce emissions by no less than uh, 7% per year on, a, on, a non, on, per year, uh, on an annual basis starting from now. So this is really huge. So that's why we do believe that uh, under the climate law uh, currently in discussion in the parliament uh, and thanks to the German presidency steering of this process, uh, 
uh, Europe will be able to get to a general approach uh, in the Council uh, uh, by the end of, of the German presidency. And we hope that the ambition will be the highest possible. Uh, we are looking forward to what the Commission is assessing uh, in terms of uh, efforts uh, needed. But we do believe that uh, we need to, to keep uh, the ambition high because uh, this is also um, uh, the reason why um, a lot of regulation that is already out there needs to be uh, reviewed and revised, uh, if not introduced uh, from scratch, uh, be, uh, in order to reach this high ambition. And, and what I talk about is, I mean, starting with the ETS, uh, the, the, basically, the main issue is that we need to uh, put the to internalize the external um, environment ne negative environmental um, uh, costs in in the price and cost of energy, and this is happening only to a very limited extent. Why? If we think about, for instance, the, the emissions trading directive, we all know that this instrument is not working uh, well. Why? Because the, the price is, is still too low. It doesn't really um, promote a fuel si switch to uh, an extent that we need. So uh, the emissions trading directive is one of the, the, those regulatory tools that need to be uh, um, addressed as soon as possible uh, uh, in order to be tighten it in terms of uh, energy price flow, introducing a floor price, but also looking at, uh, for instance, uh, uh, other related issues for uh, like the state aid uh, for energy intensive industry. State aid uh, uh, guidelines are being reviewed by the commission and uh, uh, we, have very, we were very happy to see that uh, uh, there is a, in, in, the, in, in the draft proposal for revising this guideline, there is a, uh, an article which would uh, uh, tighten, uh, which, would, which, which would link uh, uh, the state aid to uh, uh, the implementation of the requirements under Article 8 of the Energy Efficiency Directive. Uh, therefore, uh, industries would not be able to to be granted uh, uh, stated unless they implement uh, the recommendations from the energy audits. We think this is a big step forward, but it's probably not enough because the, the issue of uh, energy price is so important that uh, we need to find a, a solution to safeguard competitiveness while at the same time not put a, uh, an obstacle towards accelerating the pace of decarbonization in industry because this is where we need to go. So state aid is key also. Uh, there is also another, uh, um, there are also guidelines for energy and environment which have been reviewed. And, and this is also uh, an interesting and I mean a very important uh, issue because under these guidelines, uh, energy intensive industries uh, enjoy some uh, exemptions from uh, the payment of uh, the surcharge for renewable uh, pr um, subsidies. And these measures need to be reviewed because we cannot afford to not to face the real cost of energy. Uh, we need to find a solution for competitiveness. We are looking forward, for instance, to the carbon border adjustment measures as a possible, as a possible option, although uh, we need to see how it would be uh, built. Uh, but we really need to make sure that uh, there is enough, there are enough incentives there for uh, energy intensive industries to use all the options available. And we're talking about energy efficiency measure. We saw it with the, with the speakers before that there is untapped potential, but also further penetration of, uh, of uh, uh, electricity from renewable sources. And then last but not least, uh, another uh, regulatory framework that needs to be tightened is the industrial emissions directive. You probably know that under this directive, uh, uh, member states can set uh, voluntary limit, um, uh, limits or stand, um, performance uh, standards on uh, energy efficiency. Well, we think that this voluntary approach is not uh, good and we definitely need to have mandatory requirements of, uh, for energy efficiency under the industrial emissions directive. Um, so, uh, and, and again, this is not all because circular economy is also 
absolutely key to decarbonize industry. Why? Because we need to increase material efficiency. We need to uh, substitute uh, carbon intensive uh, raw materials with less intensive um, um, uh, secondary materials. This is already happening in some sectors, but not in all. So when we talk about decarbonizing industry, we really need to talk about a comprehensive strategy. And the industrial strategy that the Commission presented in March is 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 a, is a step forward, but is is really there is really a long way to go because we don't see this. Uh, this comprehensive uh, strategy. And uh, just the very last point on what uh, Guido mentioned, the recovery plan, I already said this before, there is, uh, there is fresh money there. We need to make sure that this uh, money is uh, conditional to, uh, uh, to, the, to compliance with uh, the European Green Deal climate, but also environmental uh, objectives such as zero pollution. So we are also working on that to make sure that uh, money will be given uh, to help uh, uh, deliver on the European Green Deal objectives. Thank you very much, Barbara. We have uh, about eight minutes to go, and uh, I would like, uh, of course, Peter to conclude and take his time to conclude. Uh, but I first would like to ask a very last question that was uh, done. I saw that some of you answered very kindly on the question and answer chat. Uh, there is a question to, uh, for, for Andreas that I would like him to answer in one minute. Uh, and then I will ask uh, to the two uh, other speakers of the first uh, uh, panel to come in for one or two uh, minutes if they have comments. And then I will give, of course, the floor to Peter for the conclusion. So, Andreas, uh, there is a question for you uh, to understand whether beyond uh, petrochemical and other energy intensive industries, in which sector you will can find more energy efficiency potential in industry. One minute. Yeah. So very brief in all sectors. Of course, okay. the temperature range and how the temperatures are uh, distributed in the different sectors uh, is very different. But in the more than 500 tip check audits we did in any plant, uh, in any part of the world, if it was chemical plants, breweries, uh, or power plants, uh, or whatever you have in the industrial sectors, of course, refineries, you find these single equipment, which are simply not insulated. You find a minimum level of insulation installed. And we just see this potentially is actually what one of the CEOs told his uh, workers was wherever you see a chimney, there is potential. Thank you very much. That was extremely, extremely clear. Um, uh, Gael, uh, ask, uh, would you have some uh, comments or some uh, remarks? Yeah, some comments or remarks. Uh, well, ju just a remark, and I, I see that uh, I think we are all aligned, uh, even within this, uh, you know, data center area, which is which is a very, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's 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 strange animal for for many people, but I think that there is some common possibilities and, and we spoke about a lot of things like uh, inclusion of renewables uh, which can be applicable to data centers as well so i think there's a lot of consistency um, back to the poll, the poll also that the question was raised and, and how, how to how to act on this is it based on, on volunteering schemes or uh, we have to, to drive uh, uh, a bit more uh, obligations. And we've always been speaking also about the, you know, the stick at the carrot. Uh, that, that's always the same story. And I think that maybe one day we'll have to go one step beyond. Up to now, it was almost based on, on, on voluntary scheme. Uh, for, for example, the correct conduct for data centers, uh, maybe uh, we'll have to go one step beyond, one step further, uh, and, and, and to act by maybe by law, or whatever. Uh, but uh, if we do this, we'll also have to maybe bring some uh, specific uh, specific fundings, uh, because, for example, or, or promotions uh, on the data center, uh, code of conduct for data centers, uh, we know that the big, big ones are, are really working with it. Uh, it, it's not always true for the smaller ones. So th there is also some challenges here uh, and, and we'll have to think about it and, and keep it in mind that yes, uh, everybody is focused on the big, big data centers and the big names we have even in Europe. Uh, keep in mind also that we also have a lot of uh, small data centers that are dispatched and split uh, all over the world and all over 
Europe for sure. Uh, and these ones also they represent uh, a non-negligible uh, amount of, of power, and we also have to be able to to to, to act uh, in, in this area. And and today it's not really the case. That that's just my point. Uh, merci, uh, Gael. Uh, merci. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Andrea. Okay. Um, maybe to, to summarize what I said and what our colleagues said before, I think energy efficiency is really a very important foundation for the transition, especially as it reduces costs also for the industry. Um, in addition, I think we need to, to work on, on all aspects of this challenge. So if we want to effectively roll out these innovations after 2030, then we also have to do these efforts in the coming decade. We need to establish this renewable energy system. We will need an infrastructure for synthetic methane, biomass, hydrogen, and we also need the, the policy and regulatory framework. So we need to support R&D and the market introduction of these technologies. We need incentives for a sustainable value chain. And we also need to support this infrastructure we need. And we need to, to extend this energy transition also to other industries like construction and the non-ETS sector. So I think this is a very complex problem with a lot of aspects and in the end we have to to bring efforts in in all aspects of this yeah this is indeed a fact of life these days we need to attack things from many uh, from many different uh, from many different angles and i just wanted to underline uh, the fact that the poll um, that was done among the some of the people that decided to participate gives a uh, in doubted uh, victory, and you saw it in the result, to the uh, regulatory approach, which is, of course, not surprising. Um, and I also want to underline what Barbara said about the aid, uh, state aid, because the fact uh, that uh, there is now a sort of free for all is, uh, is really likely to have a very, very negative impact uh, on the way in which um, the discrepancies among member states are there, but also uh, is uh, having a very bad impact on, uh, on actually Green Deal priorities. So I think that the fact that the uh, state aid uh, regulations are not there by accident, so they, have, uh, they do have some sense, although a lot of us would like to see a lot of correction in the guidelines. And with that, I would like to, um, to ask uh, Peter Hoodmacher, who is uh, the president of, I, of EIAF, uh, to um, give us his words for the end of this uh, extremely interesting webinar. Peter. Thank you, Monica. So I, I will make it short. I first of all, of course, thank all the speakers for the interesting presentations and all the experts of the panel for a factual and uh, constructive uh, discussion. And to you, Monica, thank you for the great moderation. You did a great job there. So for me personally, it was a valuable experience and I think we had an, uh, a good webinar and, and definitely I hope that everybody agrees with that. In summary, it can be a certain that there are concrete possibilities, how to save energy and reduce industry in the short and long term. And, uh, and basically my conclusion is that the keys to success for decarbonization in the industry and the digital world are mandatory policies in all European countries and innovative technologies, materials and processes. I think this, this is so to say, the, the, the big summary. Um, what I further, I, I picked up a few lines from uh, the panelists, um, maybe to, to keep in mind. I think Antti spoke about a new ecosystem approach, which is a, a much more open approach than just looking at the industry. This time it's the industry plus all the surroundings, um, like the public sector and the NGOs. I think that's an interesting uh, approach. Um, and he talked about new industrial alliances being in the battery alliances or, or the clean hydrogen alliance. I think that's also interesting. Jan, what of course made me happy that you said certainly there is space for the industrial insulation approach as suggested by the EIF. We'll, uh, we will keep you to that and, and, and come back to you. That, um, that sounds very good. And, uh, and Guido made a bigger overview. I think what was interesting was that he said, uh, um, he looked at very big picture. We have to, to rethink our way of life 
course, this is a very big, uh, big one. Um, and, and he mentioned, and I think it's fully correct, um, that, uh, that we actually have a new situation um, during and after the, the pandemic that we are actually having. Um, and this should uh, have an impact also on our strategy. So what we thought in 2015 is maybe now also to be looked at at an, a different uh, view. Some, some ideas have to be rethought. I, I think he's right with that. And uh, Barbara, um, I think you put it on the point. There's a lot of potential out there. And, uh, and you also said uh, it's, you don't need only regulatory framework, but you need the right regulatory framework. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, and we, we, uh, before we get a framework and an industry gets, uh, I, I myself come from industry, we always get very nervous about all these uh, frameworks. Um, so when we do it, we have to do it right. And so we have to think about it. But, um, but we all agree, uh, and, and, and the short uh, enquete uh, absolutely confirmed that we need a good new regulatory framework. Okay, so I hope that this, uh, today's proposals will be taken uh, into the Commission's uh, consideration by finding options to achieve uh, greenhouse gas neutrality in 2050 while preserving the competitiveness of the European industry, which is absolutely crucial. And I would like to thank everybody who has contributed to this webinar and all participants uh, for your interest. And um, yeah, thank you for joining this webinar.